one of the security guards from Gate uh, brought a message to me from the front office saying, hey, we don't know what's going on, but this is the biggest traffic jam Fox has ever had. There's over 1,600 people trying to get in who can't get in. And um, consequently, uh, there were a lot of people, prominent people, who wanted to get in and couldn't, including Meg Ryan. Welcome high-performing entrepreneurs and business owners. Do you suffer from shiny object syndrome? Do you often feel scattered and distracted, making it hard to implement your plan with all the ideas and strategies coming at you? Do you often wonder if you have the right goals and plan? Welcome to Extraordinary Focus with David Wood, where we help you achieve way more in less time. Get the laser focus you need so you can double your business, double your impact in the world, and be an even more extraordinary entrepreneur and human. Let's dive in and stay tuned at the end for your gift. Welcome everyone to another episode. And uh, you're gonna learn in this episode how to work with people at the very top of your profession, even perhaps A-list celebrities, the power of narrow niching uh, around your target market and why transformation matters in entertainment, plus some other things. Our guest is John Ratz, who has been a pilot, a stockbroker, a rock star, and publicist and advisor to legends like Jim Carrey, Madonna, and Eckhart Tolle. His projects include What the Bleep Do We Know, Peaceful Warrior with Nick Nolte, and Madonna's Ray of Light album. He is the founder of Visioneering Group, executive director of the David Lynch Masters in Film program, and founder of the Global Alliance for Transformational Entertainment, just in case you needed more. Welcome to the show, John Ratt. Thank you very much, David. Much appreciated. <laughs> yeah. And I appreciate you. You know, we've had some back and forth with scheduling. I appreciate you being <laughs> persistent. Likewise. Um, Thank you. We were introduced by Donna Steinhorn, whom yeah. I love from the um, Transformational Leadership Council. She said, you know, if you love interviewing leaders and you're in the entertainment industry now and you and she knows I'm committed to transformation, she said, you have to talk to John Ratz. So I am, oh, yeah, Donna. <laughs> and uh, apparently my computer thinks that I'm available to speak to somebody and I'm not. <laughs> so if I close down Firefox, it probably can't get to me. <laughs> All right, great. Uh, my phone's on Do Not Disturb, but my, my computer has a little back door there. Sure. So John, <laughs> I got I got questions. Absolutely. I got questions. Um, first thing, you know, when someone hears about what you've done and they hear you've worked with people like Madonna and Jim Carrey, I think one of one of the questions that arises is how could I work with people at the top of my profession? How could I work with um, whatever the equivalent is for me in my industry of, uh, of top clients, be they celebrities or not? And I'm curious what advice you have for people who might want to do something like that. That's a good question. Um, first off, I don't think, I don't believe there is a singular, a, sing, uh, a single pathway. Um, I think it's probably different for each person who aspires for such things. And I know that uh, I can look back now at my career over several decades, and I can see that all of the different life experiences, all of the different professional experiences I've had contributed to the work that I do today uh, and that I've done for many, many years. And I suspect that the same could be said to be true uh, even at an earlier stage in my career. Um, everything I had experienced, everything I had studied, every conversation I had, all of, all of the different meetings and organizations I met and belonged to, they all contributed to creating um, a kind of uh, a set of skills uh, and talents, I suppose, uh, that enabled me to work, uh, you know, increasingly with with more and more uh, people who are influencers and celebrities and the like. Um, however, I do think that one has to have a desire. And in my particular case, that desire was to work with creatives and to work with some of the best creatives in various fields. So while I've worked with people in mostly in entertainment, arts and media, 
Um, I've worked and consulted with people in other fields, and I've noticed that there are parallels between all of them. So I had the desire, I did the work, I kept working and networking and learning and so forth. And, you know, little bit by little bit, uh, various doors started opening for me, which I walked through and took advantage, if you will, of the opportunities that were there. So you would say having a passion for what you do is going to speak to people and they're going to find you and want to work with you because you have a very clear desire and they resonate with that? Well, I think that's a part of it. I don't think that's the reason why people, uh, you know, work with one with me in this case, because I have a lot of passion for whatever I'm doing. Um, I think there's a certain, you know, they, they need to they need to believe in you as a person and that you have the skill set and the values and the vision and the other qualities necessary to help them do what they want to do and achieve the same. Okay. So passion certainly is an element, but I think there are it's a constellation of of qualities, if you will, that I that I think are important. All right. And two of them being passion and and skill. Skill, absolutely. Well, you did something I think very interesting and very bold. Uh, back in about 79, I believe, you made a choice and you said, I'm only going to work. You were already working as a publicist, I believe, in in helping people uh, get publicity. And you said, from now on, I only work with transformational projects. Yes. And, well, yes, and well, what I'm... I, what I'm wondering is, did that require courage to do that? Or did you have a trust fund so you didn't care if you got clients? Because I imagine if I said, as an actor, I'm only going to work in transformational movies, I imagine I'd go hungry for quite some time. So yeah. speak to that. Yeah. Again, a really good question. Thank you. Um, so first off, um, that actually was in 1989, 88, 89. Uh, 79, I moved to Los Angeles and I had some very fortunate breaks uh, almost immediately from the time I got here, uh, working with some pretty significant people and um, things kind of grew from there. But when I finally started uh, my work in public relations and marketing and publicity, um, I did so because I was at a crossroads. So, you know, crossroads are very useful uh, elements in our lives for helping adjust our life path, uh, for help setting a new course. So I was at a crossroads and I said, okay, John, what do you want to do? And I had kept files. I had, I think, six four, do four drawer filing cabinets that were filled. And one day I sat down and systematically went through each drawer and I compiled each file folder into a pile. And at the end of that process, uh, I thought, okay, this will probably tell me a little bit more about my interests, my vision, my mission, and so forth. And I looked at the piles and virtually all of them, uh, you know, there were some, that, most of them actually that I could simply cast away, but there were certain piles that were quite large, some larger than others. And there was one related to, you know, PR, publicity, marketing. There was one related to entertainment and music um, and, and media. There was one related to financial. There was one related to spiritual. And I looked at those and I thought, okay, yes, those are all things I very much care about and resonate deeply with. And after I went through that process, I started realizing, well, John, you're doing a kind of vision process here. Mm. And, you know, I think if we, um, what, 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 what occurred to me is that, you know what, I only want to work on projects that are in these fields. And then when I stumbled upon, when the, when the largest pile, aside from the spiritual pile, which was more personal, um, was public relations, publicity, marketing, and Ned Beatty, an actor that I had worked with who was in movies like Deliverance and Network and Superman and so forth, he, one, one year for my birthday, he gifted me with a book about public relations and said, you would really be good at this. And that was about 10 years before I started my company. 
So he, you know, prognosticated that I would be good in this field. And sure enough, I had instincts, I had vision, I had skills and what have you. And so consequently, I started thinking about that and said, you know what, you should start a PR firm. Well, what are you going to call this PR firm? Well, I only want to work with people in these categories exclusively. I don't want to work with conventional or traditional kinds of things. Hmm. And what I really want to do is learn about their visions and I want to help them achieve their vision. And so I thought, oh, vision. And you know what? I'm doing what an engineer does. Vision plus engineering, visioneering. And that's how the name of my company came about. And that was the process. It's I abbreviated it for you, but that was the process I went through to to kind of arrive at that that place. And would, so I love that you took inventory and you looked at your life and you said, what do I really care about? And how do I do all of them at the same time? Right. And, and then, how do I get paid for it? Right. Right. <laughs> A very important question. Yeah. And then you, and then is that part of the process you use with your clients too, to help them yes. envision where they want to be? Yeah. Um, in fact, I mean, for a while, the session that I've done for a few decades now with my clients, um, at one point, we did call it a, a visioneering session, and we still do, but it's actually broadened. Um, it's a discovery session, it's a visioning session, and it's more than that, you know, and all of those things help to orient a client, to help give them a direction, to help ground them in certain realities like the financial dimension and so on and so forth. So yes, it's very much process oriented. I believe in process very much. And I use a process or processes to help guide a person uh, from point A to point wherever they want to be. Hmm. Wow. And and you weren't concerned at that time about, hey, if I'm only working on spiritual transformational projects, I'm going to have trouble making money? No, I, I was frankly probably too naive to worry about that. Um, <laughs> so, na you know, naivete uh, yeah. is sometimes underestimated. Um, another way of saying it is I was probably too innocent. Um, I was I was remaining true to a very pure desire that I had. Um, I didn't condition that desire by um, naysayers or by people saying you can't do this, or you can't do that. I basically didn't listen to any of that. I just focused on what was important to me, what made me feel worthwhile and said, this is what I'm going to do. And I'll, I'll never forget my very first client. Uh, and, you know, when I started my, my PR business um, and he was a corporate consultant and he specialized in change dynamics and he hired me and I did a session or two with him. And at the end of the session, he said, uh, so how much do I owe you? And frankly, I was shaking because <laughs> I, I was going to, I thought, oh boy, I'm going to just take a shot here. And at the time I thought, um, well, that was two hours. So that's, that's going to be $150, you know, and I'm shaking. And he just wrote the check out and said, can I book another session with you? Yeah, sure. Let's do it. And at that point that gave me uh, a leap in my confidence and I knew, okay, I have something, even on the basis of one client, I have something worthwhile to share. So I'm going to do it and I'm going to get paid for it. And that's the end of the story. And I don't charge that anymore, but I charge more now. But um, that's what it was back in the day. And uh, it was it was a lovely experience. <laughs> I, I love it. So listeners, I hope you're being inspired as I, as I am uh, to take the plunge to to niche, to like work out who you're going to help, have it be a group that you really love to work with and, um, and try it out. And you don't have to see, you don't have to see all the steps in front of you. You just have to see a couple of steps. And then once you've got those initial people, you need one person to be impacted yeah. by what you're doing. So you can say, all right, where there's one, where there's two. Yeah. And now, and now look where you are, you know, yep. from, from those nice steps. synopsis, nice synopsis of steps. And I would say too, in that, uh, you know, the overall scheme of things, work with people who can support you and whom you can support. Um, create those professional relationships uh, that will, um, 
you know, where there's a certain kind of reciprocity in the relationship. So there were certain skills that I knew I didn't possess, at least to any great degree. And so I brought other people into the play, into play um, who did possess those skills. And then one of the things I did is I simply said, okay, how much money do you need? And they said X number of dollars. And then frankly, I just marked that up and said, okay, well, I'm going to sell your services. I'm going to take a commission on top and we'll do a campaign and I'll give you your money. I'll get mine and I'll get a little commission on top. Right. So it worked out pretty well that way. Right. Well, that leads me to a, another question I wanted to ask. I noticed uh, one of your titles on LinkedIn was senior advisor to, to Jim Carrey. Mm -hmm. And when I was in school, they didn't, ha they didn't have that as a job option. Uh, for the career counselors to be a confidant or a senior advisor. And I found myself curious for someone who wants that job or that role, is there a schedule of fees for that? Do you charge a flat fee or would it be a commission as you it just said? It depends on the client. It right. totally depends on the client. And when we, when I use this, the phrase senior advisor, you know, I really am more of a confidant and um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, there are many role, uh, senior advisor is kind of the business way of explaining it so people understand it. Yeah. But if we dig down into that, well, there's being a confidant, somebody who will listen, somebody who will keep confidences. Um, there might be somebody with whom you can brainstorm. You may have a project that needs um, shepherding. Uh, in Jim's case, we've done many together, but one notable project that I did with Jim is helped him create his children's book, How Roland Rolls. And one, one, uh, one year after a GATE event, uh, my nonprofit organization, the Global Alliance for Transformational Entertainment, Jim and I had dinner. And Jim was somewhat lamenting that he had this wonderful idea for a children's book. And the people, the agents, managers around him didn't really either take it seriously or put much energy behind it to make it happen. And I said to Jim, well, you know, I can do that. And he said, you know how to do that? And I said, Jim, I've worked with literally hundreds of authors over the years. And yeah, I do know how to do that. So Jim said, let's do it. And literally that was in February, I think of 20, I want to say 2015, 2016. Um, and by June, we had finished books sitting in the warehouse. I found the illustrator. I found um, help with the editing of the story, um, hired the printer, uh, got a book deal uh, with um, a, a prominent distributor to distribute the book, set up a book tour, traveled with Jim around the country doing uh, book appearances, etc. We did everything fast tracked it and it happened and it was really lovely. <laughs> What a fascinating job. I don't think I even, even doing the research, I didn't get a taste of it. Um, I mean, yeah, and I'm jealous. Like, sure, I'd, I'd love to work with Jim Carrey on probably anything, but the fact that you get to take something like What the Bleep Do We Know, a movie that people say is not going to work, no one's going to watch this, and you have to work out a grassroots movement to, to sell it. You get to bring a children's book to the world with Jim Carrey. You work with Eckhart Tolle on, on work movies and books. I mean, and you get to make an impact in the area that you love. What a job you've created for yourself. Well, thank you. And I believe we all can do that or we all do that. And I think, uh, however, I do think it's more complex today than it was probably 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Um, the market is very different today. And the uh, audience attitudes and ideas and needs are, are somewhat different also. So you have to constantly be in tune with your market. And of course, any good business person knows that you need to be in tune with your market and you need to understand your audience. You need to understand them on every level, psychologically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, et cetera, to whatever degree you can that will help inform your decision. And by the way, in that regard, as I'm, as I'm starting this new version of GATE, um, one of the things that we are doing in that regard um, is we are doing a kind of focus group. And it will be for about 100 creative artists 
whom I personally invite uh, to participate in a day long session. And I'm hiring a moderator to moderate the event. And we're gonna go deeply, we, we're calling it a listening session also because we wanna listen to the needs of creative artists today. We wanna know their personal needs, their professional needs, their inner needs, their outer needs. And we're going to take all that information and use it to help inform the further development of GATE and the content of GATE. Well, so, you know, learning about your audience in that regard is very important. Well, I would not be surprised if that is enormously successful. Let's talk about GATE. And as a teaser for people who, um, I read that, you know, when you created, decided to create an event and you didn't know if anyone was going to come, I read that Meg Ryan couldn't get a ticket. Is that right. true or is that just? Yeah, really unfortunately. Um, so I'll just give you the the short version of that story. Um, when I first started Gate and we decided to have an event, uh, we were thinking, OK, where should we hold the event? What venue? And CAA had offered us their screening room uh, uh, for the event, which was very kind of them to do. And um, we turned it down because it seats about 205 people, something like that. And I said, that's, that's not big enough. And my, the, the advisors around me said, John, if we can get 200 people, we'll be doing really good because this is a very visionary kind of event and maybe not everybody will understand it. And I said, no, I don't believe that. I think there are tens of thousands of people in entertainment, arts, and media around the world who will get this, who will understand it, who will want it. Who care enough and about transformation that they're going to show up. Transformation being the core element and, of course, entertain and, and its relationship right. to entertainment, arts, and media. And back then I had this notion of starting a genre, uh, but uh, that's another story. But anyway, okay. so... Um, thanks to Jim, and I think Ben Sterling may have helped. I, I can't remember, but we got the Zanuck Theater on the Fox Studios lot. And the Zanuck Theater holds about 500 people. So I thought, well, that's still small, but you know what? Let's do it. And we did it. And um, I, could, I filled it almost single-handedly myself. It was standing room only. And um, one of the interesting things at one point, one of the security guards from Gate, uh, brought a message to me from the front office saying, hey, we don't know what's going on, but this is the biggest traffic jam Fox has ever had. There's over 1,600 people trying to get in who can't get in. Um, and it's like, well, you know, that's that because we're, we're, we have standing room only and we're not going to violate uh, any, you know, laws. And um, consequently, uh, there were a lot of people, prominent people who wanted to get in and couldn't, including Meg Ryan. And, um, you know, we were sorry about that, but uh, the response was overwhelming, uh, even more than we thought it might be. So I want to acknowledge you for something. You, look, carving out a niche and saying, all right, I'm going to work on publicity in the entertainment industry, visioning for people who... Uh, one of, who are working on spiritual projects, transformational projects. That's amazing to take that risk and then be successful in it. I think is wonderful, but yeah. you went a step further. You said, I think the world wants this. I think that there are enough people who want more transformation in the entertainment industry and I'm willing to bet on it and get a theater and enroll Jim Carrey and other people. And you proved that that was true that you didn't just get your 200 people, but people couldn't get in. So I think that's just such an enormous step to spot something in the world and find out, oh, people have just been waiting for someone to come along and be the spearhead. And it seems that at the moment, this is you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you again. Well, I think it's even more true today uh, than it was then. Um, and, you know, the initial indications I'm receiving from people who have found out that we have revisioned gate, we've focused it in a different way. Uh, and we're doing, you know, the first, the, the ver a new version of the website. I'm getting, uh, you know, contacted by people, by creative artists from around the world. Uh, most recently, a couple of days ago from a person in Holland 
uh, wanting to be a part of it. And uh, one of the people who I work with now is from Sweden and they travel back and forth between Sweden and Los Angeles. So, um, and but the creative artists that I've spoken with get this right now intuitively. And the vision statement of GATE, which has evolved over the years, um, it's essentially the same statement, but there've been some um, acute refinements to it. So now the vision statement is creative artists united in transforming the world by transforming entertainment, arts, and media from within for the benefit of earth and its people. And every word is chosen for a reason. There's a, if, if you really think of it as a sutra and then you explore that sutra, you go into it and you explore it, you'll discover that there's a lot of, there's a lot of meat on that bone, so to speak. And it's, it's it, you know, it kind of, it's a very thorough and complete expression. And um, I can't take credit for it. Um, yeah, it came through me. But honestly, Gate, from the very beginning, when it first emerged in, you know, even though I didn't know it was Gate at the time, but my first experience of it was in 1977, approximately, 78. Um, and ever since then, it's kind of been growing within me more and more. And part of any process, starting a business, uh, forming a career, et cetera, is being true to that vision and maintaining it and nurturing it and watering it. Um, you know, there's a beautiful expression, only a new seed will yield a new crop. And I felt that if we did want to usher in a time uh, of, of greater, more profound entertainment, arts and media offerings that a seed had to be planted that would offer people a vision of what that is and how we can achieve it. And mm -hmm. I believe that's what GATE does. That's one of the things that GATE does. Yeah, and I want to talk about the future success of GATE because I, I feel interested and invested in that. But firstly, I want to call out one other thing you did. There's one other element to this that I think I'm picking up on from my research. You didn't just say, hey, I think this is good for the world who's interested. And I think a lot of spiritual people do that. A lot of creatives are like, come on, <laughs> come on. <laughs> but what you did is you brought a financial model with it. You brought in some left brain practicality and said, there is a market for these movies. There is There are population segments that are going to buy these tickets, that are going to yeah. buy these albums. And I, I have a lot of respect for that. And I suspect that's a part of your success with GATE is because it isn't just, oh, come on, spirituality is good for the world. It's like, it will pay you too. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, there's a conference coming up in Los Angeles in December that I'm, I believe I'm participating in that explores that relationship between social impact and, and monetary uh, considerations. But, you know, here's the thing. Um, again, once you know your market, um, you can begin to discern how to, how to interact with it on a financial level. And I feel like um, today, we, you know, a lot of artists are, are like, okay, I'm an artist, and they wait for the world to pay them, to feed them. You can't do that. You could never really do it. But even more so today, that's true than it was 30, 40 years ago. Um, you have to ask. You have to ask. This is something that a lot of creatives, a lot of people are afraid to ask. You know, will you help me? Will you pay me? Will you do this? Fill in the blank. Um, and if you don't ask, generally you don't receive. Um, and this is not a law of attraction thing. This is just a practical reality. Yeah. Um, and what am I going to give in return for that fulfillment of my ask? What can I give that will be meaningful to you, that will, that will, that will help uh, fulfill whatever your dreams are, your goals, your desires, and so forth? And you know, hopefully there's an exchange there. I have a saying I, I uh, say to myself on a regular basis to refresh it. Trust in life unfolding, trust in life unfolding, trust in gate unfolding. When something that comes up, I'll act on it and then see what feedback I get. And then I'll act on that, I'll act on that, and I'll act on that. 
the vision is what it is and the mission is what it is. And those will be explicit on our website. But um, I don't plan per se. I don't sit down and plan uh, because I believe that the emergence of gate is intuitive. It is coming from another dimension, another realm, if you will. And I don't say that to be woo-woo. It's just that's the reality I've experienced. And that's how I know it's emerging. And so the best thing I can do to ensure its success and its its life, its, its longevity, is to just pay attention, listen, and act. Pay attention, listen, and act like that. I love it. So at, at this stage, is there anything listeners can do to support Gate, or we should just watch and be ready when when the time comes? Watch and be ready, because I don't want to say I don't want to give a particular date when the website will launch, because I'm you know it'll it could be next week, it could be the end of the year. My intention is for it to be done and and released before the end of the year. It will be a soft release initially. Um, and I'll put the word out through my various channels and networks uh, that people can go and check it out. And hopefully the word will spread rather quickly and then we'll see what unfolds after that. And I'm in sure. the meanwhile, I'm happy to you know consult with people and take on marketing and publicity campaigns and those kinds of things. Yeah. And, and my hand is up. If you need some support in GATE, I don't know what it looks like, but I, I keep feeling called to... <laughs> help prop it up and and so much. Grow it in the world. yeah i would look forward to that working with you all right well uh anything else you want to say uh before we wrap this up i've loved this particularly actually i'm going to double click on something you said about this ask you have to ask yes. this goes i assume not just for creatives for anybody but especially anybody. if you're creative you have to ask there was a teacher once um I don't know if you heard of the Morehouse. You probably, you, you, yeah. might, you may have. Um, but it, Vic Baronco used to say, ask nothing from a man and you get nothing. Yeah. And I just thought it was such a provocative but powerful statement, which puts 100% responsibility back on us. It does. It really does. So to that point, if I may, yeah. um, these days, many people come to me and say, you know, uh, how, how, how can I be a part of gay? And I turn it back around and I say, instead of asking me what you can do for Gate, tell me what you're going to do. Yeah. Have a creative thought. Bring that thought to me and say, this is what I want to do to support Gate. Otherwise, you're being lazy yeah. and you're not really engaging. You're simply wanting to be handed something on a silver platter. Here, go out and do this. And then you can say you're involved with Gate. Well, I don't want that. I want people who are ready to take action who bring ideas to me that will help establish Gate and what Gate's intentions and vision and mission are. I love that. And listeners, you can apply this uh, to pretty much anything in your life. You want to get involved in something, you want to be part of it, bring your ideas, bring your passion, bring your energy. Don't just go, hey, what can I do? Yeah. Like I just did. Doesn't work. Okay. <laughs> Great. All right, John, it's a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you. Thank I really you. enjoyed My it. My pleasure. Thank you, David. I appreciate it much. You've been listening to Extraordinary Focus with David Wood. Now, to achieve way more in less time, to double your business and your impact in the world, and to be an even more extraordinary entrepreneur and human, make sure you get your gift basket. It includes a cheat sheet to double your focus, a short video to implement the steps, and a free focus audit to identify the number one focus leak in your business and how to plug it. To get all three of these goodies, just go to myfocusgift.com. If you've gotten value out of this episode, tell your friends. And nothing says keep up the good work, David, like a review, which helps us climb in the rankings and reach more listeners. Now, let's be extraordinary.